Hey everyone, I'm Charlotte. I'm Dina, and welcome to The Grim Curriculum. For our first episode ever, we have decided to visit something a little closer to home for both of us, uh, a case from our very own city of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. That's right. Today we are covering an Edmontonian killer with a love of filmmaking, Star Wars, and cosplay. It's Dexter-obsessed serial killer wannabe Mark Twitchell. Uh, Twitchell was convicted of first-degree murder in the death of 38-year-old Johnny Altinger and is also known for the attempted murder of Gilles Tetreau. He wrote about his fantasies in SK Confessions, a 42-page fictional document that starts with the line, This is the story of my progression into becoming a serial killer. So, let's get into our very first episode, Mark Twitchell. Let's do it. Mark Andrew Twitchell was born in Edmonton, Alberta on July 4th, 1979. Not much is known about his early life and upbringing, but it is believed that he grew up in a relatively normal home. According to what we could find, he spent the majority of his younger years in the American Midwest. In the late 1990s, Twitchell returned to Canada, where he enrolled in the TV and radio program at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, also known as NATE, where he graduated in 1999, and I also graduated in 2017 from the design program. Fun fact. You were so close to being classmates. Oh, so close. It's almost like the year after. I really missed out. He didn't have many friends at NATE, but he did hang out with a core group of people. One of his friends, Drew Kenworthy, remembers him as a decent guy, but not someone you could really rely on. He was known for coming up with excuses and lying about unnecessary things and not holding up his end during group projects. Absolute worst kind of guy. Seriously, we have all met that guy. Uh, he pulled some super shady other stuff too. He once participated in a charity event where the authentic, quote unquote, Star Wars artwork he was auctioning off was actually discovered to be fake. And when he was confronted about it, he just refused to acknowledge the whole situation. In the year 2000, Mark Twitchell met his first wife, 20-year-old Megan. Megan lived in the States, but that didn't stop them from pursuing a serious relationship. He proposed to her over the phone, and she soon moved to Edmonton to marry him. And they had only been speaking for a few months, right? That's right. He wooed her, and he earned her trust very quickly. She even described him in an interview as... A charming guy. Really sweet. Smart. She went on to say, He called himself a renaissance man. He even sent her a dating resume that included photos of him to win her over. Among them were some of his finest cosplay headshots. He came across as a really nice, fun-loving guy who had a passion for filmmaking and cosplay, and she probably thought she hit the jackpot. The honeymoon phase didn't last long. Shortly after their marriage, Twitchell's lying started up again. He began to lie about paying the bills. She would constantly have debt collectors calling and would be left to handle it after he had promised her that the bills were being paid. She also found out pretty quickly that he had a pretty serious problem with lying, which had gone as far as him being unfaithful to her. She also became aware of a different side of Mark Twitchell, his online presence, which she called a darker side of Mark. He would often go online into chat rooms and dating websites pretending to be someone else, usually a woman. Go figure. This later evolved into Twitchell going online and role-playing as fictional serial killer Dexter Morgan. This would unlock a fantasy world that he would later try to bring to reality. It became clear to his wife that he enjoyed messing with people. Now, if you've never seen it, Dexter is a show about a serial killer who is also a blood analyst for the police. Dexter believes that he has a need for murder and justifies it to himself by only killing the guilty. He usually kills his victims in a kill room with plastic sheets on the walls and floors. And Twitchell was absolutely obsessed with him. Shortly after they had gotten married, Mark Twitchell dropped a bombshell on his wife. He asked her if she had ever thought about killing someone. He told her, I've thought about finding a homeless person so people wouldn't really be able to know who they were or connect it. She states then that she had the realization that she was thousands of miles away from home with a man she didn't really know. How horrifying. That is horrible, especially you're 20 years old, you're in another country, your friends aren't there, your family isn't there, and this guy who you thought was like the perfect guy is now telling you he wants to kill people. Yeah. And I mean, it's one thing to learn little quirks about people as you get to know each other, especially, you know, getting married so fast, but like to have this kind of, yeah, bombshell drop on you. Absolutely. And she even told him, like, I mean, we all have dark thoughts, but it's about not acting on them. Exactly. 
And with all of that, they ended up splitting up shortly after, and it didn't even take them that long to move on. Yeah. And I don't want to get too far into Twitchell's love life without talking about his one true love, Star Wars. In 2007, Twitchell took his love of filmmaking and Star Wars to a whole new level when he directed a full-length fan film called Star Wars Secrets of the Rebellion. The majority of the movie was filmed on a green screen with a heavy emphasis on the costumes and props, and he actually managed to get a cameo from Jeremy Bullock, who, for you Star Wars fans out there, that's the original Boba Fett from the original trilogy. Uh, The film was never released, despite Twitchell spending two years and $60,000 developing it. And I have a fun fact, too, for our Edmonton listeners out there. In 2007, Mark Twitchell won first place at both the Bears Halloween Howler and Sonic's Monster Mash Halloween Bash with his Bumblebee Transformer suit. And that's a pretty big deal. It really is. Mark met his second wife, Jess, online, just like the first, wooing her with his kindness and charm. Less than a year later, they married, and shortly after, their daughter was born. Twitchell, however, grew very bored of his family life. He purchased his family a home in St. Albert, which is a city just outside of Edmonton. The problem was that he had actually purchased the house with fraudulent documents. He also quit his job around this time to pursue filmmaking professionally. He pretended to live off of investors' money, and there was actually a fair bit of it. He not only borrowed a lot of money from his wife's brother, he borrowed $30,000 from his friend's parents. He also scored a major investment for his movie Day Players of $30,000 from Venture Alberta, which is kind of like Shark Tank. In his sales pitch, he presented fake numbers and a lot of promises. Originally, he asked for an investment of $1.5 million for a return of $33.9 million in just five years. He also promised top-tier actors such as Alec Baldwin, Kevin Smith, Justin Timberlake, and Jeff Goldblum. Day Players was supposed to be a comedy about the life of extras, which I'm pretty sure is already a TV show at this point. It's called Entourage. (laughs) During this time, his wife had no idea he quit his job. He would pretend to leave for work every day and come home after about eight hours. He's also soon started working on his short film, House of Cards, a nine-minute horror short that he said was inspired by his own marital problem. Uh, House of Cards is basically about a cop turned serial killer, and if that sounds familiar, it should. Uh, He hunts down cheating husbands online, lures them back into his garage, he stuns them, and they wake up taped to a chair with a guy in a black and gold hockey mask staring at them. And honestly, the scariest thing about this movie is the dialogue. I'm not going to subject our dear listeners to this. Uh, This is our very first episode. That's fine. I will gladly subject them. Are you ready for this? (laughs) I'm going to cut your nutsack off and show it to you. Do you read me, mister? My god, the talent. Pure talent. And honestly, the twist at the end is that the entire thing was a story that the actual serial killer was writing. So the serial killer is written by a serial killer that was written by a wannabe serial killer. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Mark also confessed to kissing an old girlfriend in 2008, which we will get to a little bit later. Um, Mark and his wife began sleeping in separate rooms at this time, and it was also around this point that she realized he hadn't even been going to work. She also found him on a dating website and confronted him. He told her he was doing research for a freelance story and promised to let her listen in on a call with the editor. Later on, it was revealed that he had lied about that too, and I wanted to share this from the court transcripts. This is his ex-wife asking about who she had spoken to on the phone that day. I said... Was the editor real? And he said, no. I said, who was that man? And he said, it was an actor I had hired. He hired an actor to pretend to be an editor for a freelance story rather than admit to his wife what he was doing. This guy is so full of lies, it is absolutely unreal. And she wouldn't see him again until after court. On October 3rd, 2008, 33-year-old Gilles Tetreau found himself following directions to a garage in Edmonton where he was supposed to meet a woman named Sheena for a date. The two had met on Plenty of Fish, a dating website about four days prior, and he was looking forward to dinner and a movie with an attractive and intelligent woman. Little did he know that Sheena was actually Mark Twitchell, who at this point had had years of experience with impersonating women online. Now, looking back, Gilles Tetreau admits that Sheena had had a lot of control in the situation in regards to when and where they meet up, and she insisted that he pick her up, which he said he didn't mind. 
Sheena had also failed to give him an actual address. Instead, she gave him directions to a garage. Jill did not tell anyone where he was going. Always tell people where you are going. Absolutely. So Jill followed the directions to the south side of Edmonton, and shortly after 7 p.m., he pulled into the back alley and arrived at the garage. Meanwhile, Twitchell had prepped the garage with soundproofing, plastic sheeting, and a dissecting table that he had made for House of Cards. He then logged into his Dexter Morgan profile and wrote a status. Dexter is patiently waiting for his next victim, a playday buddy. That is horrifying. Imagine, you are new in town, you're excited because you're going to meet a pretty lady for a date, and it ends up being this. Exactly. And once Jill arrived at the garage, he crouched under the half-open door, proceeded to go through the garage in the dark, and before he could even get to the other side, Twitchell jumped out in his black and gold hockey mask from House of Cards and the stun gun in his hand. He touched it to Jill's chest, and it immediately didn't affect him other than a small zap, which Jill later described as annoying. Twitchell had used a stun baton, not a taser, so what that means is that you don't go down right away. It affects you over time. He didn't realize this. And just for everyone else's reference, uh, stun guns administer the electric shock through direct contact, whereas a taser device administers it through thin, flexible wires connected to the probes. They're fired into the target, just like you see on TV shows. Uh, Both are illegal in Canada for civilians to carry, along with pretty much any other self-defense tool like pepper spray and what have you. Gilles moved the baton away and he began to run. It was then that Twitchell pulled out a gun. Seeing this, Gilles did what he was being told and Twitchell put tape around his eyes. At this point, Gilles began to panic and fight again. He began shouting, I'm not going out like that. He stood up and he ripped the tape from his eyes. He was able to get the gun away from Twitchell, and he quickly realized the gun was fake. It was a fake gun that he had rented from a prop store. Gilles began punching Twitchell in the face and fighting him off. He began to bend the gun while Twitchell screamed at him not to break it. Gilles was able to get out of the garage by crouching under the half-open door. Unfortunately, when he tried to stand up and run, his legs had finally given out from the stun baton, and Twitchell almost pulled him back into the garage. Luckily, he was able to get away, and he ran to a nearby walking path where he found a couple going for a walk. The couple actually refused to help him because they thought that he was part of an elaborate plot to rob them, because once Twitchell had caught up, he claimed that they were just two friends messing around, all while still wearing his hockey mask. The couple ran off, uh, fearing for their safety, which caused Twitchell to run away too. Jill ran to his truck and was able to get away, He ended up not reporting the incident to police out of embarrassment until far, far later when Twitchell had already been apprehended. It's so easy to say, well, you should have reported it or you should have told someone, but at the end of the day, you have to remember that there was a much larger stigma around meeting people online, especially from a romantic standpoint during this time. This was an incredibly traumatic thing for him to go through, and it's absolutely understandable that he just wanted to forget that it ever happened. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So he went home and went to bed. The next morning, Sheena's profile was completely gone. Mark Twitchell's attempt to act out this murder fantasy had failed, but it would only take him until the following Friday to try again once he realized the crime had probably not been reported. John Altinger, or Johnny as his friends called him, was born in April of 1970 in Edmonton, Alberta. His friends described him as a quiet and giving man with a warm grin and gentle eyes. Like many others, his life had had its fair share of ups and downs, but he had appeared to be in a good place by October of 2008. He was 38 years old with a passion for technology, computers, and motorcycles, and he would often help his brother with university assignments. He worked at an oil field equipment manufacturer doing quality control on night shifts, and like many men his age, he spent time looking for love on various dating websites. He met a woman on Plenty of Fish in 2006, who he ended up becoming really good friends with. They had dated briefly, but realized that they were better off as friends. She would later describe him by saying, He was a positive, upbeat person who tried to get people to turn their negative thoughts to positive thoughts. Overall, Johnny was known for being a really good guy who was just looking for love. He thought he had found a good chance at it with a woman named Jen that he had met on Plenty of Fish. She was pretty, intelligent, and liked all the same things he did even Star Wars. Meeting people online wasn't uncommon for Johnny. He had a very active social life, both online and off. He was known for staying in touch with his friends, and he had spoken with a friend about his plans for the evening, and even shared the directions and location that Jen had given him. Shortly after 7 p.m. that evening, he let his friend know that he had arrived. Johnny arrived at the garage only to find Mark Twitchell. 
He had set up the garage again and was ready for him. Johnny called out hello in the dark garage and Twitchell answered hello back and turned on the lights. He explained to Johnny that he was a filmmaker and that all the things around him, the rope, weapons, a chair with handcuffs, and the plastic covered wall were just for a movie set. Twitchell even took this as an opportunity to plug his movie Day Players, which Johnny had obviously not seen. Johnny asked him where Jen was, and Twitchell explained that she was stuck in traffic and was running late. Johnny Altinger at this point was fed up and left, but before Twitchell could even come up with another plan, Johnny returned. Twitchell picked up his phone and pretended to call Jen. He had an entire fake conversation in front of Johnny about how she was still stuck in traffic. Mark told him that if he wanted to, he was more than welcome to hang out and wait. Johnny left for a second time and called his friend to tell him what had just happened and how weird the whole thing was. However, when he got home, he sent a message to the Jen profile asking what had happened. 20 minutes later, she responded that traffic had cleared up and she was finally home and that Johnny could come back and see her if he still wanted to. Johnny, who figured he had already come this far, left his home for the last time and drove his red Mazda back to the garage. When he arrived, he once again saw Mark Twitchell and gave him a nod and said, I guess I'm just a glutton for punishment. That was when Mark Twitchell brought the lead pipe down on his head. I have to say that this story in and of itself is very sad, but the fact that he left twice is just so incredibly sad to me. He genuinely wanted this to work out for him. He wanted to fall in love, and instead this happened. Mark hit Johnny again and again and again with the lead pipe as Johnny tried to fight back. Twitchell then stabbed Johnny in the stomach and then the throat, killing him. This is where we really see how dark Twitchell actually is. It's one thing to fantasize about something or even just write about it, but he genuinely wanted to do the things that he fantasized about, and he went out of his way to make it a reality. It goes even further than that. He lifted Johnny's body onto the table that he had set up for House of Cards and began dismembering him. Once he had finished that, he put Johnny's cut-up remains into garbage bags. He even wrote in SK Confessions that he had sang little songs to himself while dismembering the body, and that he had stopped for snacks and to check his email and eBay listings. He also wrote, I grabbed his jaw with my gloved hand and moved it while making a funny voice to make it look like it was talking, and chuckled to myself at the total silliness of it all. After he finished with the body, Twitchell began to clean up the garage using ammonia. He took down the plastic sheets and with great difficulty loaded the body into the trunk of Johnny's red Mazda. He then pushed the Mazda into the garage because he didn't know how to drive stick. He called his wife, lied about being at the gym, and a lie that she caught onto pretty quickly because the gym was not even open. He would later confess to an online friend he had met using his Dexter profile that he had crossed the line and liked it. According to SK Confessions, he even sat down with his seven-month-old daughter and confessed the entire murder to her. He wrote, The cool thing about a seven-month-old is that you can openly tell them anything and they can't rat you out. Johnny was missed immediately. Two days later, his friends became concerned when Johnny didn't show up for a bike trip that they had recently planned. He was known as being a very dependable person, and it was unlike him to not show up to something he had committed to, especially with his friends. Trying to hide the fact that Johnny had gone missing, Mark Twitchell broke into his apartment and logged on to Johnny's computer. There, he changed Johnny's relationship status from single to in a relationship and posted the following Facebook status. John has taken off to the Caribbean for a few months. See you all when I get back. Wondering why anyone would leave sun and surf to come home to snow and stress. After that, he sent out the following email to Johnny's friends and family. Hey there, I've met an extraordinary woman named Jen who has offered to take me on a nice long tropical vacation. We'll be staying in her winter home in Costa Rica. Phone number to follow soon. I won't be back in town until December 20th, but I will be checking my email periodically. See you around the holidays, Johnny. He then sent a resignation email to Johnny's workplace. When they asked for an address that they could forward his final paycheck to, they received no response. At this point, Mark still had a body to dispose of. His plan was to get rid of the body by burning it in a barrel that he had purchased. He didn't want to draw too much attention, so he put the bags containing Johnny's body into the barrel and put the barrel into the trunk of his Pontiac Grand Am. He then drove to his parents' house and attempted to burn the body in their backyard. For someone who appeared to have had this all planned out so well, he really didn't know what he was doing here. He thought that if he poured a coffee cup of gasoline onto the body that it would burn hot enough to completely destroy it. This is obviously not the case, and all that did was generate a ton of smoke. 
He continued to pour coffee cups of gasoline onto the body with no luck. For reference, when a human body is cremated by a funeral home, the furnace will reach around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit or 980 degrees Celsius. And suddenly, he heard sirens, which caused him to panic and put out the fire with the hose. The sirens passed by. Somehow, no one had noticed all of the smoke. He then decided it was time to move to Plan B. He loaded partially burned and gas-covered body parts into his car and went home. On the way home, Twitchell was feeling romantic. He called his ex-girlfriend Tracy to see if she wanted to see him again, and on his way to go see her, he was pulled over by a police officer for speeding. The police officer cracked a joke about Twitchell's custom Dark Jedi license plate, and when asked why he was speeding, Twitchell told him that he was a filmmaker who was in a hurry to get to the airport to pick up a very important celebrity. The police officer, not noticing the still lingering smell of gasoline, let him go with a reduced fine and another joke about the license plate. At this point, Twitchell had put the body in a temporary location and had not yet cleaned the car. After escaping yet another close call, Twitchell went to see Tracy. He had disposed of the body in a sewer a few blocks away from his parents' house. Meanwhile, Johnny's friends had grown very concerned. It was pretty clear to them that this was not something Johnny would ever do. They reported their concerns to the police, who basically just brushed it off as a man who was going through a midlife crisis and had left for what sounded like a nice vacation. Johnny's friends, not believing this, decided to break into Johnny's apartment. These are really good friends. They knew him well enough to immediately know this wasn't him. It wasn't how he talked, and it wasn't something that he would do. They knew something was wrong, and they took matters into their own hands. If they hadn't, it's really hard to say how long it would have even taken them to catch Mark if they had caught him at all. They broke in and found his passport, uneaten food, and no evidence that he had even packed for a trip. That, combined with the fact that they had directions to the last known whereabouts of Johnny, led police to the garage. If they had arrived there just a few days earlier, they would have seen Johnny's red Mazda, which Twitchell, unable to drive, had left there. Twitchell would later call his friend and tell him that a random guy had walked up to him saying that a rich woman was taking him on vacation and offered to sell him his car for 40 bucks and that Twitchell had happily obliged. His friend ended up storing the car for Twitchell at his parents' house. Twitchell hadn't even cleaned the car, which had bloodstains on the back of it. This was the same family who had invested $30,000 into day players. Police at this point had caught on to the fact that the man renting the garage that Johnny Altinger was last seen at may be a suspect. Twitchell, during his interrogation, appeared pretty willing to talk to the police. Detective Bill Clark even noted while first interviewing Twitchell that he seemed very trustworthy and not at all deceptive. Mark, of course, took the opportunity to talk about day players, his Star Wars fan film, and the fact that he was a filmmaker working on big things. Near the end of the interrogation and before the garage was even searched, Twitchell, without being asked about it or it even being mentioned, brought up the fact that he had purchased a red Mazda from some guy for $40. The police, who had been looking for the red Mazda, had what they needed to turn this into a homicide investigation with Mark Twitchell as the only suspect. They really hadn't asked at all about a car at this point. It wasn't even at the garage, if you remember. He had stored it at a friend's house. If he hadn't said something, the police may not have found it right away, if ever. The comment about the car gave the police what they needed to go from a missing persons investigation to a homicide investigation. Mark's explanation was that someone had broken into his car recently and stolen something from the garage. He explained to them that this was probably the same person who sold him the Mazda to begin with, and probably the same person who Johnny had told his friend was at the garage when he called him the day that he went missing. The police pushed Twitchell to confess, telling him that he wouldn't be able to live with himself if he didn't, Twitchell responded, You'd be surprised with what I can live with. After this, Twitchell secured a lawyer, and the police had enough evidence to impound and search his car, which Twitchell still had not cleaned, despite having had at least three or four days to do so. In the car, police found his laptop, as well as the murder weapon with blood still on it. They were originally looking for a potential snuff film because of the horror movie talk around House of Cards. They accessed his laptop, and while they didn't find a snuff film, they found something else, SK Confessions, which he had deleted but not removed from his trash bin. The wild thing about them finding SK Confessions is that he wrote, These are the stories I will tell the police if I am ever caught, even mentioning lying about buying the car, not to mention the fact that he detailed all of his crimes and fantasies. It's all right there. In the garage, they found more evidence. There was still a lot of blood in the garage. 
Police found blood on the ammonia bottle Twitchell had used to clean up, as well as a blood-covered lead pipe with hockey tape grip on it. Soon after, they matched the blood to Johnny's, and they had what they needed to arrest Mark Twitchell. Meanwhile, Twitchell's day was turning around. He still hadn't been arrested, and he knew that if they hadn't found a body, he may have gotten away with it. At this time, his wife had kicked him out, and he was staying in his parents' basement. Edmonton police didn't want his arrest to be a big scene, therefore they get all the credit for one of our favorite arrests of all time. While working on his Iron Man cosplay for the next Howler, Twitchell received an email from a potential investor who had seen his Star Wars fan film and wanted to be a part of Twitchell's upcoming project. Twitchell pitched day players and the investor was very interested. The next day, the investor contacted him again and let him know he wanted to meet that Friday, Halloween, and discuss things. Twitchell was ecstatic. The only thing is, there was no investor, and when Twitchell turned the corner towards the coffee shop they were supposed to meet at, he was met with a white van and several officers yelling at him to get down instead. They didn't want to arrest him at his dad's house, so they lured him out with the false hope that all of his dreams were about to come true. The fact that he catfished these men the way that he did, only to be essentially catfished by the Edmonton police, is pure justice gold, and I love it. So good. Now, as we already said, the police had a ton of evidence. However, they were missing two important things, a body and a confession. In an attempt to get Twitchell to tell them where he had hidden the body, they took him on a videotaped tour of the city. During the tour, they pushed him to tell them what he had done with Johnny Altinger's remains. Unfortunately for Twitchell, Gilles Tetreau had seen a press conference where the police had shown the black and gold hockey mask that Twitchell had worn during the attack, and he had come forward. He would later testify in court, and Twitchell would also face an attempted murder charge. SK Confessions was used in the trial. Some parts had to be omitted because the Crown, defense, and the judge deemed it to be too inflammatory. It contained a ton of information into the mind of Mark Twitchell, including the words, I let him bleed out right there on the floor. And it's an interesting feeling driving around with what used to be a human body bagged in your trunk. No one has any idea that they are stopped at a light right next to a serial killer. In SK Confessions, he even wrote about people he was planning to kill in the future, including an old boss of his. There are so many things in this case that tell us that if the police hadn't caught Twitchell when they did, he would have quickly attempted to do this numerous times. He had no intention on stopping, and he expressed no guilt about what he had done. So Charlotte, you actually found SK Confessions and read it. What were your thoughts? I sure did. It's 42 pages of ultimate cringe, honestly, but it was remarkable at how, although the names had been changed, uh, or rather, uh, like, Gilles' cha- name had been changed, for example, that he had got them down to every single beat of exactly what happened, which is kind of telling maybe into the arrogance of Mark and that he could just write it down. But overall, pretty cringy stuff. Over the course of 18 days, the jury saw over 100 exhibits and heard testimony from numerous people, including the evidence from SK Confessions and Twitchell's Dexter profiles. He claimed that he lured Altinger into his garage in an effort to generate online buzz for House of Cards and killed him after Johnny had become enraged at being lied to. The jury, not buying this, found Mark Twitchell guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Twitchell showed no reaction to this news. When given the option to speak in court, he simply said, I'll pass on that. Interestingly enough, it was reported that Twitchell did cry when he watched part of the interrogation tapes to the point where a break had to be taken. Detective Bill Clark, who had led the investigation, said, We caught him on his first one, so he's a very poor serial killer, and thankfully, he will never become a serial killer. And? Notice how once he had a chance to come here to apologize and say something, he chose not to. He doesn't care. It's all about him. Because he had received life in prison, the courts did not proceed with the charge of attempted murder for the attack on Gilles Tetreau. Without getting into too much, Canadian law did not allow for the cases to be tried at the same time, and the attempted murder charge was eventually just dropped. Twitchell attempted to appeal his case, citing that the media coverage made it difficult for the jury to give him a fair trial. In 2012, he abandoned his appeal and accepted his fate. It also took over a year for Twitchell to tell police where he had hidden Johnny's body. 
When detectives arrived to speak with him at the Edmonton Remand Center, he passed them a paper with a Google Maps photo and the words, Location of John Altinger's Remains. The directions led them to a sewer grate near his parents' house where the remains of Johnny Altinger were found. I'm not going to lie. I wish I could tell you that Mark Twitchell was having a terrible time in prison. I really, really do. But I don't think that's the case here. Twitchell is currently serving life in prison at the Saskatchewan Penitentiary, a medium security institution with some maximum security areas. Twitchell seems to have the respect of his fellow inmates and his story is very well known amongst them. According to what we could find, he's well behaved in prison. He's believed to have a flat screen TV in his cell with access to over 60 channels. And he was uh, able to finish watching the Dexter series. He's also looking for love. That's right. We have Twitchell's prison dating profile here. And in it, he says he is looking for... An interesting, intelligent, open-minded, delightfully imperfect woman to relate to and share amusing observations with. As well as potentially a long weekend every few months, if it gets there naturally. When responding to this, Detective Bill Clark said... Let's face it, we've got a narcissistic psychopath, and I'm sure he'll be able to fool some woman into writing to him who will fall deeply, madly in love with him. And that Twitchell may likely end up getting conjugal visits. He plans to continue working on his filmmaking, and he will be eligible for parole in 2033. And so that's it. That's the story of Mark Twitchell, serial killer wannabe from our very own Edmonton, Alberta. This is a wild case. It really is. He went out of his way to turn his twisted fantasies into a reality, and it ended up with the death of another human being. And it blows my mind that in a little over a decade, he's going to be up for parole. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see. And I want to add, Gilles Tetreau really spoke out about this case and shared his story with the world, which takes a lot of bravery. He has been interviewed many times, and he even wrote a book called The One That Got Away, Escape from the Kill Room. His interviews are actually really interesting to watch, and I highly recommend checking the book out if you are interested in learning more about his experience. He didn't give up on love either, and as far as we know, he lives in Edmonton with his wife and son. So that's it. That's the story of Mark Twitchell, Dexter Killer wannabe. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we are really looking forward to our next. Make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. It was a little too long with the the. You can also find us on social media. I am Dina V on Twitch, Dina V tweets on Twitter, and Dina V I G on Instagram. And I'm ominous underscore walrus on Twitter and ominous walrus on Instagram. Thank you so, so, so much for listening to our very first episode. Yes, thank you so much. We cannot wait to share our next case with you soon. This has been The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.